Welcome to Ambo TV. I'm Dean Windsor, and we have some amazing next gen, next level pastors from around the country for you today. We have Pastor Levi Lusco out of Fresh Life Church in Kalispell, Montana, and he's going to be talking about commitment issues, and he's doing this through the book of Joshua. So it's going to be super cool. Can't wait to see that one. And we have Hope Church out of Warren Robins, Georgia, and Pastor Jordan Poole. And he's going to be talking about throwing shade, which is something I think we all should check out at this point with social media and everything else. And then we have Pastor Drew Karshner out of Northridge Church in Rochester, New York. And he's going to be talking about God's relentless mercy. And he's doing this through the book of Jonah. So also something you're going to want to stick around and check out. And with us today in studio, we have a special guest, Ashley Abercrombie from Liberty Church right here in New York. Hey, Ashley. So great to be here with you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for being <laughs> here. So I want to go ahead and check out Pastor Levi Lusco in Fresh Life Church in Kalispell, Montana. Let's go ahead and check it out. It's Joshua at AI. It's been Joshua, all these battles, calling us to God, fearlessly following the Lord. And now the, the realization is it's going to be life after Joshua. It's going to be life after this amazing leader. So there would be emotion they would feel because of the loss of this good leader who led with integrity and character. And he wasn't perfect. He made mistakes, but he was a good leader. And so that would, that would be emotional. But there also, also at this moment was emotion because of, of the goodness of God. And that's far more important. And that's what Joshua was pointing them to. Because long after he's gone, God's still going to be good. Long after he's gone, God's going to be the Lord. And your connection to God is going to be helped by a lot of people throughout your life. But, but you must rely fully on God and not on any person that God uses. I hope your small group leader, I hope the team leader on your team, I hope the godly people in your life who encourage you are a blessing to you, and I hope you honor the pastors and leaders that God brings your way in life. But I'm telling you, your faith has to rest solely on God. You have to trust in him because there's, there's, there's one mediator between God and man, and that is the man Christ Jesus. So, so any pastor, any earthly leader is going to let you down in small ways or in large ways, but your faith has to rest on him. And one person being revealed as being mortal, as we all are, cannot be enough to devastate your faith if you have built your life on the chief cornerstone, God's Son, Jesus Christ. So the goodness of God is what Joshua is pointing to. He doesn't use his last speech to just say, look how good I've been. He, he says, man, look how good God is. Look how good, good. look how good God is. And what does he do? He points them to the past. Because when you look to the past, what you find is evidence of God's goodness. Sometimes when you're present, it's hard to understand what he's doing. Because sometimes he seems absent. Because you're so close up to the canvas, you can't see what the colors are creating. So with time, you get to see. I, I, I figured this out in Life Church. The, the fingerprints of God are best observed in the rearview mirror of life. So sometimes you get some distance. You realize, man, God is good. Because what, what does Joshua say? He goes, remember Abraham? That fool was an idolater. <laughs> now, we call him the father of faith. He started out as an idolater. And now that's, that's like almost like sacrilegious for him to be messing with Abraham. Abraham, he, he's like, dude, Abraham? He's like, yeah, Abraham, that was weird how he was worshiping the sun. Wasn't that weird? All those idols? In fact, some commentaries believe that, that Abraham's father owned a, an idol manufacturing business. What was the family business of Father Abraham? All these little trinkets and idols that people use to worship sex and worship money and worship the God of the, of the moon and the God of the harvest and all that. That's how Abraham started out. And so what he's saying is, how good is God that he would use someone that messed up? How good is God that he would call him? And then he says, how good is God that he would use us? And then he just points thing after thing after thing to God's goodness, God's goodness, God's goodness at the Red Sea, God's goodness in Egypt, God's goodness, 40 years wandering in the desert with y'all being a bunch of whiners, 40 years of the goodness of God. And as, as, as the stories of God's goodness went out, this emotion of gratitude would rise up. You know, they say if you take even just a few minutes once a week and write down five things you're thankful for, that your perceived sense of your happiness in life will increase by as much as 25%. Because it's easy to get into this, woe is me, life's so hard, I didn't get invited, this person got my promotion. But I'm saying, when you just look back and go, thank you, God, for saving me. Thank you, God, for life. Thank you, God, for my car. Thank you, God, for my kids. Thank you, God, for this. Thank you, God, for this. All of a sudden, you, it shifts something in your spirit. So this emotion of, of gratitude. And then he, he gets to his big like crescendo. He's like, hey, and look at this country we get. Hey, those olive, olive groves, we didn't plant those. 
Hey, that, that, that city over there, we didn't build that. Hey, the, the town over there, we didn't plan that. God gave us cities to live in. We didn't build because he gave them victory over the enemies. They were driven out, and they got to live in cities that were fully built. They got to, they got to in, enjoy the, the use of land for which they did not labor. He's basically saying, God did it. God gave it. We just get to enjoy it. How good is our God? You know what? I feel like that right now. Because I was, I was looking into the past, into the records, thinking about how 100 and 110 years ago, respectively, someone decided to open up a hotel called the Hotel Montana. And 100 years ago, someone decided there needed to be a theater called the Liberty Theater. And every single brick was built. And God allowed it, and God permitted it, and God oversaw it only to a point. Because he saw in his mind's eye the day that this would be a house of God for his people to praise him. God gave us a hotel and a theater. To, we got to connect them. I know we did something. We worked hard on it. But you know what? God did it. We're here on this day not to say, look what we did. We're here to say, thank you, God, that you gave us a city to live in. We didn't build. You gave us buildings that we didn't. You see, even back then, God saw what he was planting. God knew on the day the first brick was slid into place that this room would be filled with praise for his son and that lives would be saved here, changed here, healed here, made whole here, that we would walk in forgiveness here, that from here he would launch a work that, like the continental divide, would reach from coast to coast, like the rain that goes to the east and goes to the west, that God would bless the country and bless the world from little old Kalispell, Montana, but God did it, and we get to walk in it because we're a part of the only thing that will outlast everything, the church of Jesus Christ. Names that are powerful today like Amazon and Tesla and Apple and Coca-Cola and Wells Fargo, I'll tell you what, a million years from now, there is one name being spoken today that will still be spoken. It's the name of Jesus. It's the name above every name. Whatever's big now, whatever's big a hundred years from now, there's still a name above every name. And what we're a part of is what he's doing. And when we lose ourselves from, from our, focusing on just our little story and little life, and we, we lose ourselves as a, part, as a part of something bigger, we get to discover the God outside of time, what he was setting up, and then we get to play our little part in it. And we're a part of something so big. And here's the exciting thing for you and for me. Just as he was a hundred years ago planning this moment, what was he planning 80 years ago that we're going to discover 20 years from now? What, what was he working on 50 years ago? What's he doing right now that our children's children are going to walk in one day? I'm telling you, we're not done yet. We need to keep fighting, keep growing, keep believing, keep dreaming, keep building. Whitefish is next. Come on, Salt Lake City's coming. I'm telling you, we got we got work to do. We can't relax on our laurels. Yes, it's a celebration, but we don't relax. We just reload. Come on, someone. There's, there's still more work to do. Be still more hurting people to reach. Just one more. Just one more. Just one more. Wow. Super powerful and super interesting. Uh, Pastor Lusco again with a tidbit that I really wasn't even aware of. And that's the possibility of Abraham's father. Abraham, the father of religion, his father, actually possibly owning an idol workshop. And Abraham still, God still choosing him to be the father of religion. I, I think that's amazing. And Ashley, what, what did you find most interesting about, you know, that little clip of mm -hmm. Pastor Lusco's sermon? Well, I love what you just said because we all have a past, right? Yes. And then my other part that I loved was when he talked about the faithfulness of God. And so often in my life, I think about the times that have been really difficult or the times where I'm waiting on a dream or the times that I'm believing for something bigger. I've just suffered a devastating loss. Yeah. It helps me to look back on life and go, God was faithful in a mess before and God was faithful in a hard time before and God was faithful through the difficulty before and he will be faithful again. Yeah. And so I really loved hearing that part of the sermon. Yeah, no, it, it was super interesting. Mm -hmm. And I mean, even the way he pointed out that, you know, through the rear view mirror yeah. is when we start to see God's Huge. work. Yeah. Yes. And, and we fail, I think, sometimes to see it in front of us. Yes. Which, you know, wh why do you think that is? Why do you think that we have such a, like, we have these blinders on sometimes? Yeah, I think we do. Well, I, we've gone through a lot in life, right? So yeah. I think we struggle to hope and we struggle to see vision and yeah. we come up against difficulty and we want to retreat instead of going, yeah. you know what? Life is hard and yeah. building something beautiful is hard and building something with strength is hard. And so we have to keep hoping and have yes. to keep our eyes on vision, even when things yeah. are difficult or challenging. Absolutely, I agree. Okay, we're gonna go ahead and take a quick break. Uh, when we come back, we're gonna have more Pastor Levi Lusco and some more awesome sermons for you guys, and also more Pastor Ashley. Uh, you don't wanna miss it, stick around. This is Ambo TV.
Both my legs were amputated due to an IED. It's when you start to try to get back into like an everyday life. I absolutely felt like I lost some of my purpose. There must be something more. When DAV came into my life, they gave me a new mission. I could still be a productive member of society, could still support a family. The DAV gave him that sense of structure and purpose again to get his life back together. Visit DAV.org to learn more about our mission. Anyone can fall victim to moving fraud. Know your rights and responsibilities. We had really signed off on a price and that was about it. Without a signed written estimate, movers may try to charge more. They were charging us now $2,000 instead of the agreed upon 900. And may hold your items hostage until you pay. Not only had they roughly handled or mishandled, it seemed like they had purposely destroyed things. Visit protectyourmove.gov to download a free moving fraud prevention guide. Search for registered movers and view their complaint histories. Move with confidence. All across the country, people are coming together to speed up what we can learn about health. The All of Us Research Program is calling on one million people to join us as we try to change the future of health. For your family, for future generations, for all of us. Visit joinallofus.org and find out how you can become one in a million. Both my legs were amputated due to an IED. It's when you start to try to get back into like an everyday life. I absolutely felt like I lost some of my purpose. There must be something more. When DAV came into my life, they gave me a new mission. I could still be a productive member of society, could still support a family. The DAV gave him that sense of structure and purpose again to get his life back together. Visit DAV.org to learn more about our mission. Hi there. You might wonder what a famous Hollywood celebrity like me is doing reading in the dark. This is some new sort of Hollywood method acting. No, this is quite real. Did you know that Americans use about four times as much energy per year as the global average? We waste energy left and right despite the fact that the dirty fossil fuels we use to power our energy sources wreak havoc on the natural world and destroy valuable wildlife habitats. By reading with my solar-powered night vision goggles, I'm saving energy and looking fleek. <laughs> you don't have to sit in the dark like Ed Bagley Jr. to save the world. Fight climate change by speaking up for cleaner, smarter energy, including rooftop solar. Oh, that's way better. Oh. Do your part and find out other world-saving tips at betterthaned.org. Welcome back to Ambo TV. Thanks for sticking around. I want to go ahead and throw it really quickly to Hope Church in Warren Robins, Georgia with Pastor Jordan Poole. And he's going to be talking about throwing shade. This should be a really interesting sermon. It's your responsibility to guard your mouth. Let me help out a little bit, a little bit more. What James 3 verse 8 says that no man can tame the tongue. Somebody's scratching their head right now saying, well, then why are we talking about this? If I can't control my tongue, then what in the world are we doing here? And we would, and, and you would be right in your, in your opinion, but we, we skip over something in that scripture. Did you notice it says, no man. No man can tame the tongue. No man. That means I have to employ the power of something supernatural if I can't tame the tongue. If every animal in the world can be tamed except this, and, and if I can, if people can, think about that. If I can tame every animal in the world, okay, including great white sharks. <laughs> How do you tame a great white shark? I don't know. But I can't tame this. And you're going to tell me I got to control my tongue? I got to guard my mouth? Because it's not going to be by your power that you do it. It's not going to be by your power. It's, it's going to be by his spirit, says the Lord. See, I'm trying to encourage you to become more dependent on the Holy Spirit. I'm trying to encourage you to get into the things of the Spirit and to understand the gifts of the Spirit, understand the fruits of the Spirit and how they operate in your life and how you need to understand. We'll talk about this next week, the language of heaven, which is, yes, we believe in the baptism of the Holy Spirit by the evidence of speaking in tongues. We believe in that. 
We believe that it is a heavenly language. We believe that when we speak in another tongue that our mind cannot comprehend, that my body, my, I'm being edified. And we believe, yes, that someone can speak in a tongue that no one knows, and there can be an interpreter who can, who can activate their spiritual gift of interpretation to deliver a message from heaven. That is the power of speaking in a heavenly language. I wish somebody who was spirit-filled in this room could give me a hallelujah or something. There's a reason when God came down in Acts chapter 2, he didn't, put to uh, he didn't put hammers of fire over their head. He put tongues of fire over their head because he wanted to change the history of mankind, and he first had to address their mouth. Everybody say, pause. For the cause. <laughs> Proverbs 10, 19. Why do I got to guard my mouth? You want to know why? Ask me why. So glad you asked. Proverbs 10, 19. In the multitude of words, sin is not lacking. In the multitude of... When many words are spoken, sin is going to be present. But he who restrains his lips... When you want to cut down that person... I don't know about you, but I've been getting so convicted before I even open my mouth just at the thought of saying something nasty or mean. I just, uh, mm, mm, mm. just going to start talking like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. <laughs> but he who restrains, see that? He who restrains his lips. I can't control what you say. I'm only responsible for me. Stop trying to take control for what everybody else says by responding to what they say. Restrain your lips. Lips, the fruit of the lips. Fruit of the lips, which is praise. That's what Hebrews instructs us to give is fruit. Fruit, fruit, seed. What James say? An olive, a, a fig tree can't bear olives. What does that mean, James? A fig tree can't bear olives? That means it's unnatural. That means I can't expect supernatural works in my life through the power of God if I'm sowing olives but expecting figs. I can't sow discord and sow gossip and slander, all these things we've been talking about, and expect God to bless my life because I come in for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning and sing some songs. No, something has to change. I have to be transformed. And it's going to take more than Sunday morning to transform our walk with Christ. Everybody say pause. Wow, Pastor Jordan Poole serving up some knowledge there. I mean, yeah, very cool, very cool. So, you know, in, in society today, and the way we kind of fall back on, you know, oh, that person speaks their mind, and so they are, you know, you hear that so many times, you know. So is there any particular way you, you know, kind of hold back? Are there like, you know, um, lessons you've learned or are there things that you practice in order to kind of subdue yourself or do you just let things fly Yeah, when well, you're not around your flock? Right. <laughs> no, I try, I do have a high commitment to integrity, right? Yeah. So I want to be the same person in all spaces. If I can, we don't always hold yeah. up to that, but doing my best to do it. But I believe in telling the truth. I think there is so much power in telling the truth. And at the same time, the Bible talks about our words being seasoned with grace. Mm. Um, and so they have to come out. Truth needs to be coupled with grace or yes. it's not effective. You know, without love, people can't hear any truth. And with too much truth, people don't feel love. So we've got to find a way with grace to speak to people and tell them yeah. the truth. So we can't avoid the truth, which a lot of people do in society as well. So yeah, it's cool to like speak the truth, but passive yeah. aggressive is a real thing. Yes. <laughs> you yes. Know? So people do have trouble actually communicating honestly. Yeah. And so for me personally, how I do that is having a high commitment to integrity and knowing like the truth is helpful. It blesses people yes. when we tell the truth, but it's gotta come with love and it's gotta come with grace. <laughs> love it, love it. Okay, so really quickly, I wanna go ahead and throw it to, uh, Pastor Drew Kirshner out of Rochester, New York and Northridge Church. And he's going to be talking about relentless mercy. And the list goes on and on and on in our lives. Where we choose our way instead of God's ways. And that's exactly what Jonah does. And guess what he's going to find out? And guess what we always find out? That running from God never works. Running from God, I, 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 it's the strategy we use on a regular basis, but it's a strategy that has never been successful. 
You would think we would give it up, right? Like, hey, this has never worked before and it probably will never work and yet we continuously do it. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense, but that's how we live. We run from God on a regular basis and yet it's never worked. And guess what? Jonah's about ready to figure that out face to face with God. Because here's what Jonah does is Jonah was called to the Ninevites, modern day Iraq. But Jonah almost mocks God. Because he says, not only am I going to run from what you want from me, I'm going to go in the polar opposite direction. I'm going to go to Tarshish, which is modern day Spain. Jonah is basically saying, God, I don't want to have anything to do with what you're calling me to. In fact, I'm going to show it to you because I'm going to go in the complete opposite direction. Go home, look up Nineveh and look up Tarshish or look Iraq and look up Spain. They're like completely the opposite direction. And Jonah's like, yeah, well, whatever, God, I don't really care. It says this. He says, he went down to Joppa where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from God. And scripture gives us this imagery where Jonah has now postured his life. He's turned his back towards God. He says, God, I don't care what you're calling to me because guess what? I'm going to run away from it. I'm turning my back to you, God, and, and I'm, I'm fleeing from you. And so you see this imagery of, of how Jonah has postured his life. But look what the next verse says. It says, then the Lord sent. You see, while Jonah was running from God, he failed to realize that God was running after him. That although Jonah thought he could get away from God, he, he failed to realize that in his running, God was going to pursue him. God was going to chase after him. And when you think about God, you think about the God we've, we've come to worship over four campuses at many different homes today. I think maybe one of the most beautiful things about God, you know, we get caught up in, in the miracles of God, the, the power and the majesty of God, or, which are all good things to get caught up in. But maybe one of the most beautiful and amazing things about God is that we can run from him, we can rebel against him, we can say we want nothing to do with him, and yet he still pursues us. He still loves us. And, and, and as humans, we just don't get that type of love because I don't know about you, but if someone abuses me over and over again, I give him a good-fashioned stiff arm and I walk away from the relationship. But yet, we abuse God on a regular basis, and yet God still comes after us, and God still loves us, and he still chases after us. And then it's like we say to God, like, hey, God, I don't want to have anything to do with you. And God says, I, I want to have everything to do with you. It's like we say, God, I don't want to love you. And God says, I can't stop loving you, because that's who I am. And even in our rebellion, God still pursues us. Even when we are sinners, that's what the Bible says, that's ultimately the gospel of Jesus Christ. While we were still sinners, rebelling against God, fighting God off, running from God, he still died for us. What a beautiful thing about the God we serve is it's, it's a picture of the gospel. Jonah just declares who Jesus is. I mean, you think about the story. Jesus is standing there. Pilate's like, hey, I want to release the prisoner. Barabbas or Jesus? They say, hey, give us Barabbas. Well, what should we do with Jesus? Kill him. We don't care. Crucify him. And here Jesus is on a cross, dying on our behalf, pursuing us, even though we didn't love him. And I don't know about you, but I am so grateful that God didn't give up on me when I gave up on him. I'm so glad that in the midst of my sin and my junk, God didn't say he's not worth it, but he said, I'll go to a cross to prove you that you are worth it. And that's the truth of the story of Jonah right here. Jonah turned his back to God and God said, watch me follow you and watch me continue to use you. I mean, the way he speaks about how we run from yeah. God, it's, it's got to hit home yeah. a little bit. I, I don't know for you, but for me personally. Yeah. So, I mean, have there been moments where you thought, you know, and I think this is with a lot of people too, they think, well, the way to worship is, you know, some people go to church every Sunday and some people don't eat meat on Fridays. That's their way of worshiping. Mm -hmm. I have my own way. Mm -hmm. Is that, do you find, you know, other people have different ways of worshiping and is that okay or? I think running is a big deal because again, we all have a past. We all have things that we're dealing with. We all have stuff that we've come out of. You know, for me personally, I was addicted gone through so many things, drugs, alcohol, eating disorders, just gone through all kinds of crap that I did not want to deal with. Running from my issues, running from my yeah. past. And in so many ways, that's similar to the story of Jonah. And the reason yeah. he was so upset with the Ninevites is because they had hurt him and they had hurt his people. And so I think whenever we've been hurt, whenever we've been wounded, we want to run. Yeah. But yes, worshiping, I think um, 
we don't have a right to judge each other about how we worship, but at the same time, it's so good to gather in community. I think this idea of being independent of a community or being independent of God actually isolates us in a way that helps us run instead Absolutely. of drawing closer into community so that we can be connected to one another, which helps us thrive in our lives. It helps us heal. It helps us grow. Okay, absolutely. I'm going to have to go take a real quick break, but we'll be right back with more Pastor Ashley and with more Ambo TV. Welcome back. And now I'm going to go ahead and get back with Pastor Levi Lusco out of Fresh Life Church in Kalispell, Montana. Let's go check him out. But then he, with all that kind of setting the stage, he gets down to brass tacks. Joshua, he's old, but don't misunderstand what you're dealing with. Like Yoda, the cane is just for fun. He, he, he could still fight. 
because he, he drops down this decision. He calls them, to, third word, a decision. It's a decisive moment. It, it's the gloves come off and, and the gauntlet gets thrown down when he says, yeah, there's reports that there's still idols in the camp. Oh, it got quiet up in there. It got quiet up in there. Yeah, so I understand that there's still some idolatry happening. I understand some of you are still worshiping sex and worshiping the sun and worshiping the moon. Awkward. That's how we started. He says, that's, that's, what, that's what God delivered us from. That's how Abraham used to be. I mean, look at it. Let it, let it sink in, the gravity of it. When he says, you guys got to serve the Lord and put away the gods that your fathers served. How are you still worshiping the gods that the people on the other side of the river worshiped? You're telling me some of them snuck in and smuggled in in their carry-on luggage, little Egyptian gods, and they're still, you know, on, at low moments. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're showing up to church for sure, but at low moments, they still go back to their go-to God when they need validation, when they need security, when they need to hit. There's still these, these certain things that they, they're resorting to. And, and, and so they're, they're worshiping God, but their hearts are mixed. Their hearts are not loyal. And so what does he call them to do? He says, put that stuff away. You don't need that stuff. He says, instead, you should evaluate the options and choose for yourself this day whom you're going to serve. If you want to worship one of those gods, great, go worship them. Go build a temple to them. Do, go, 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 go gangbusters, get a tattoo of their name, Marduk on your forehead or whatever you want to do. If that God's better than the God who's done all this stuff for us, then please go, go worship them. But if you're going to worship God, then worship God only. He's saying, pick a team, y'all. He's saying, He's saying, I'd rather have you be 100% against God than just 50% for him. Because it's insulting for you to even bring any other God into the same conversation with our God. There's no God but our God. Any other thing you can worship, think about it. What else could you live for? Because everybody has a God. No, no, I'm an atheist. You have a God. You have a master passion. You have a controlling interest. You, it just might be you. And what a crappy God you are. You are not a good God at all. But some of us are living lives as our own gods. Our careers are our gods. Or, 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 or some achievements are God. Or some drug is our God. But when you cancer and pray to that God, it's silent. Its mouth doesn't move because it can't speak. Its ears don't listen to your prayers. When you need it the most, whatever you look to, maybe it's your figure. Maybe it's your sex life. Maybe it's how powerful you are. Maybe it's the money in your bank account. But when you desperately need it, it doesn't say anything to you, does it? Because you're talking to a volleyball. So he says, that's a funny reference to Castaway. <laughs> so he says, he says, choose for yourself this day whom you serve. Now, I have to point out just real quick that this, this fiery ultimatum, this, this moment of decision, it comes after he tells them all that God's done for them as his chosen covenant people. It doesn't come before. Meaning, he, he didn't say, choose. He didn't, he didn't walk into the meeting. All right, there's, there's idols in here. Give me your idols. Pass everyone through an idol detector or something like that. You know, be, be, start wanding people down for, for little like Buddha statues or something. You know, he, he, doesn't, he doesn't do that and then say, and if you throw the idols away all the way, then God will give us all of trees we didn't plant. And if you really get rid of the sin in your life, then guess what? God's got a great building for you he wants you to live in. Because that's religion, isn't it? Behave get saved. That's not, that's not our God. Our God says, believe and you'll receive, even though you're unworthy, even though you still got your suitcases full of idols. Our God cleans his fish after he catches them. The amazing thing about grace, they don't want you to know this, is this, listen to me very carefully, is that God's righteousness is not based on you, it's placed on you because of Jesus's credit. So God, God just gives you lavish treatment, gives you heaven, gives you his calling, gives you his spirit, gives you his home, gives you his family, gives you gifts, gives you power, gives you everything that he has. It becomes yours. And then he says, now that you've been given it all, give it your all. Now that you've been given it all, evaluate and look, what are these other things doing for you that you still have with you? Do you have room in that, for that in your life? And he calls you to shed the sin that so easily entangles and the weights that slow you down and to cast those things off, not so God will love you, but because he does and will never stop loving you. That's grace. Pastor Levi Lusco again with the gems. Real <laughs> quick question. Casting things away, their weights on our souls. Do you agree? Yes, I do. I think we all have things that we've gone through. We all have stuff that we're entangled in, you know, whether it's addiction or dealing with issues, problems, and pain. It's like common okay. to the human experience, but God's grace covers yes. us and helps us. 
Absolutely. I want to go ahead and throw it back to Hope Church in Warren Robins, Georgia, and Pastor Jordan Poole throwing some shade. <laughs> Check him out. Because he starts to say things like, there was a uh, uh, man named Naaman who had leprosy, but he wasn't sent to anybody except the prophet, what was it, Elijah? And that frustrated, that angered the people so much because Naaman was uh, on the opposing side. He, was, he represented another country that would come into little villages and, and, and amongst Israel and, and raid and plunder. So the fact that Jesus mentions this enemy general gets everybody ticked off. Watch it. They take Jesus out of the, temp, out of the synagogue and they take him all the way. They, they, an angry mob. And they, they lead him all the way to a cliff. And so this is the beginning of his ministry, Kathy. What a way to start it. At a boy. And they lead him to the cliff because the Bible says in, in Luke 4, 28 through 30, they were going to throw him off the cliff. They were going to kill him on a cliff. But the Bible says, go to verse 30. When they took him out there, he wasn't standing in front of them like, I'm Jesus. I'm the Messiah. Come on. Look how talented I am. Look how gifted I am. Uh, come on. Look how much money I got. He didn't respond at all, did he? What the, he says, he just passed through the midst of them and went on his way. He just, he didn't say nothing. Because sometimes the greatest way to say something is to say nothing. <clears throat> And he walks through the crowd just. I don't know if he flew up out of there. I don't know what he did. But it says he just walked through the midst of them and he went about his business. You need to go about your business and stop trying to combat everything with a response. Watch this, because there will come a time when your response does the talking for you. When, you, when your fruit does the talking for you. That's my, that's what your takeaway. Let your fruit do the talking for you. Because now fast forward to the end of Jesus' ministry. He's now being led out to another cliff. They tried to kill him at the beginning, but he just, because he had some stuff to do. And if he would have stayed there trying to argue and debate about who he was, he wouldn't have got to this second cliff. And they led him out to another cliff called Golgotha. This place was called the place of the skull. And Charles, whoo, what does poise mean? Whew, poise means to be suspended without motion, but steady. And here he is suspended on a cross, showing the most powerful poise mankind has ever seen. And even when a thief that was crucified next to him was mocking him, he still had the poise to look at the other one and say, today you will live with me in paradise. He had the poise to hang up and be suspended motionless. And they were spitting on him. And they were saying, if you are the son of God, trying to invoke a reaction out of him. Do you know what his response was, suspended? Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And the people that have hurt you, and the people that have talked about you, and the emotional wounds that some of you have, some of it has come from people and situations that didn't even know they were doing it. But you've been carrying it. You've been walking with the wounds, and it's been affecting your life. And today, there's healing here. And you can have the poise of Jesus to say, Father, I forgive them, for they don't know what they're doing. I'm going to continue on my way. I'm going to walk with Holy Ghost poise, and I'm going to seek your face and I'm going to allow you to do the talking for me. I'm going to allow the fruit of my life, I'm going to allow the fruit of my praise be the response that I give to every critic, to every problem, to every issue in my life. Forgive them, Father, for they know not what they do. Possibly one of the most iconic and most, uh, you know, uh, repeated quotes of the Bible, you know, um, 
excluding the Sermon on the Mount yeah. and every quote from there and every parable. Yeah. So now listening to Pastor Poole, mm -hmm. just a really energetic, a really vibrant totally pastor. Is. Yeah, I the way that. he delivers his sermon, it's, you know, it keeps you hooked, it keeps you watching. Yeah. Was there, from this particular clip, was there something that really hit you that he said? Mm -hmm. I mean, what, you know, it could have been either Jesus on the cross mm -hmm. or it could have, you know, what, was there one that really stuck out to you? Well, I think that this idea of forgiveness is so powerful. Mm -hmm. It's, you know, freedom starts with forgiveness. And so I love what he shared because all the issues that we face, all the wounds that we've had to go through, uh, people who have hurt us, you know, whether it's a teacher, a coach, a parent, um, a spouse, like I don't know what people have gone through, but when you think about the power of forgiveness to set us free is so amazing because sometimes we can see life through the lens of what's been done to us mm -hmm. or through the lens of what we've done to others. And when we release that with forgiveness, we're able to see life as it is and then move forward in our lives instead of constantly being focused on what's happening around us or what's happened in our past, we can be focused on the future. And so I love thinking about the power of forgiveness. It's life changing. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And I mean, you know, another thing that people love and a cliche that people love to throw around is, you know, um, forgive and forget. Oh, right. But in order Impossible. to. Well, <laughs> See now, see you know, now here's your memory thing. doesn't get erased. No, like it you, is. Yeah. No, you're right. You but know, you impossible. have to try to at least forget. <laughs> yes. And you know, so because you can't really forgive unless you forget. Mm. So that's why the two can't really go hand in hand. Mm. Because how can you forgive something that is constantly playing over and over in your mind? Right. As us as humans, anyway, yeah. we're not. You know, we're, we're Christ-like, but we're not mm. Christ. Mm -hmm. So only He can. Great. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get into a break. This is Ambo TV, and we'll be right back.
But I want you to understand this is Ambo TV, and we're watching Pastor Drew Karshner out of Northridge Church in Rochester, New York, and he's talking about the book of Jonah. But I want you to understand why God pursues you. You see, God pursues you to win you back, not pay you back. God pursues you to love you, to restore the relationship back to him, to reconcile what we've made wrong. Yes, don't get me wrong. God does discipline those who he loves. That was part of the storm with Jonah. But the truth is, is God wants to win your heart back. And as we look at the beginning of, of Jonah, what's interesting is if you, you study this story, a lot of scholars believe that it ties with a New Testament story, the story of the prodigal son. They believe that these two stories work in tandem together. And in, in, in Luke chapter 15, we read the prodigal story. It's a, it's a relationship between a father and a son. And this dad, the son comes to the dad and he says, Dad, I want everything that belongs to me. I want my inheritance now. And so the father reluctantly gives it to the son and the son goes and rebels, runs away from all the dad taught him and he goes and lives in, in, in this party lifestyle. He blows all the money that he was given, all of his inheritance on wild living. And he finds himself broken and with nothing. All his friends have left him. And it's gotten so bad in this son's life that he's looking at pigs on a farm and longing to eat what the pigs are eating. And ultimately, it's a picture of what happens when we run from God. Right? When we choose our own way, guess where it leads? To destruction to starvation, to whatever it is. Like when we choose to rebel against God's way in our life, it doesn't pan out the way we think it does. It might for a season, but eventually we're, we're left unsatisfied, unfulfilled, longing for more. That's where the son is, starving to death. But then something happens in him. Luke chapter 15, verse 17, it says this. It says, when he came to his senses. And maybe today... We need to come to our senses. Maybe today we need to be awakened to the fact that rebellion against God, running from God never works. I, I honestly believe maybe some of us, including myself, we need to, to understand, we need to come to our senses like this young man did that, wow, this isn't working. In fact, this is ruining my marriage. This is ruining my relationship. This is wreaking havoc on my family and in, and in everything in my life. Like, it is not going well. And we are awakened to the reality of our rebellion. We come to our senses. We, we, we see, wow, this isn't what I pictured it to be. And so this led this young man, he came to his senses, and then in verse 20, he, he acts on this behavior. He sa it says this, so he got up and went to his father. And this is the hardest thing to do. It's easy to come to your senses. It's easy to see all the circumstances falling apart in your life. That's easy to notice and to recognize. But the hard thing to do is to go back to your dad. Go back to God and look your father in the eyes and say, I wasted everything you gave me. It's hard to go back to God and say, God, I'm sorry that I've neglected your word. God, I'm, I'm sorry I messed up my marriage. God, I'm, I'm sorry I, I've lived in a, a manner of gossip. God, I'm sorry I haven't read my Bible. God, I'm sorry I've been selfish. God, I'm sorry I haven't fought for justice. God, I'm sorry I've neglected prayer. And the list goes on and on. It's really easy to see the bad things in your life. It's really hard to turn and own up and take responsibility for them. And in Scripture, in Luke chapter 15, the son begins to practice what he's going to say to his dad. It's like, ah, oh, Dad, I'll just be your servant. I just, I just want to be a part of the family again. That's all I want, Dad. And you want to know why it's hard to run back home? You want to know why it's hard to go back to God? Because when you run back and you stare God in the eyes and the son stares his father in the eyes, guess what you lose? Control. Because this boy knew he could tell his dad he was sorry, and his dad could say, get out of my house. You are no longer my son. This, this dad could say, you wasted everything and you come running back to me, there's no place for you anymore. 
He couldn't control the response of his father. And when we turn back to God, what's scary is we can't control how God responds to us. But yet, Luke 15 gives us a picture of how God responds when his son and when his daughter runs home. It says this, verse 20. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son and he threw his arms around him and he kissed him. You see, I think sometimes we, we, we don't see that this father probably every day was waiting and looking over that hill for his son to come home. And that is exactly what God does for us when we rebel against him, when we run away from God. God sits there and he, he doesn't wait. He, he goes after us. He pursues us. And what's interesting is when we turn back to God, God doesn't have to run to us because he's always been there with us. We, there's, there's no like he's running to us. It, it's, hey, I've always been here and I've been waiting. My arms have been open. I just long for this day that you came home. And so this morning as we look at the story, I would just really ask you this question. Where are you running from God? Where are you rebelling against God? It, it might be in a big way, but maybe it's in, in small ways. Where you know what God's word has called you to and you're just ignoring it. You're not being obedient to it, you're running from it. Having to go back to the mother, to the father, it's, it's tough, it's a struggle. I mean, is there any advice that you would give somebody who is about to take that journey, who, who's admitted to themselves as did the young man in, in mm -hmm. Luke. You know, is there any advice that you would give to somebody that, that's just at their absolute bottom and they know the only way to make a reparation is to go back home? Mm -hmm. And that starts with, you know, your mother and father and then eventually God. Mm. Well, I think the opposite might be true for some people because okay. so many people have parents that they can't go to that are not filled ah, with grace. And so okay. often we can't get closure from other people because we cannot be dependent on their responses in order for our healing to be facilitated. And okay. so I think step one is actually doing what the prodigal son does, which and his father is representative of God the Father yes. who has his arms open around us. And so that's the first step. And I would say to anybody, I've been there, you are not alone in yeah. your pain, in your weakness, in your mess, and just do it afraid. Like it's never gonna be a perfect time. You're mm -hmm. never gonna feel completely free from fear. You just do it afraid because the Father's arms are open. I've actually had an instance in my life where I had mm -hmm. to go back to and my uh, my family very uh, very religious hardcore mm. religious, and the, that can be tough. It's super tough. Yeah. And when I was at a you know a hard point a rocky point in my mm. life where I think you know a lot of people find themselves sometimes, I went and I looked for help. Mm -hmm. And I think my my I'm not going to say which family member did it, mm. but my this family member who had the means to help me, they actually helped me in the best way possible. What they did was. They wrote something down on a piece of paper and they slid it to me and I looked at it. I turned it over and I looked at it and it was the address hmm. to a shelter. Oh, wow. So I said to him, and at that point right there, I hmm. said to myself, you know what? It's time to get my crap together. Hmm. I got it. So at that point, I knew family wasn't going to do anything. Hmm. Family wasn't going to do anything. My girlfriend wasn't going to do anything. The only person that was going to do anything was God. Hmm. So I had to get right with God first. And I did. And so, you know, I began to pray more and I began to really focus on fixing myself instead mm -hmm. of looking for other people to help fix me. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. So, so you actually made a better point than I did. And I asked you <laughs> if anybody needs to go back to their parents, is there anything, just one little piece of advice you would give anyone that's looking to turn back to God really quickly? The, the quickest piece I could give you is that it does not matter what you've done. It literally does not matter what you've done. You can turn to God. Like he is not mad. He's not angry. He's not sitting up ready to, you know, just come down on you. He's full of grace. He's full of mercy. He's full of love. And so there is nothing that we do that could separate us from that love. Awesome. Nothing. Okay. <laughs> so on that note, we're going to go and take a break and we'll be right back with more Ambo TV. What would happen if if I had to pick up the phone, call 911 for one of my family members or one of my neighbors, what would I do if, if no one was on the other end to respond? What if there was no 911? So you can be a part of the solution. Anybody can be a firefighter, male, female, younger, older. We are school teachers. We are leaders in business. Is me, you, anyone that wants to be. There is no typical firefighter. 
my legs were amputated due to an IED. It's when you start to try to get back into like an everyday life. I absolutely felt like I lost some of my purpose. There must be something more. When DAV came into my life, they gave me a new mission. I could still be a productive member of society, could still support a family. The DAV gave him that sense of structure and purpose again to get his life back together. Visit DAV.org to learn more about our mission. All across the country, people are coming together to speed up what we can learn about health. The All of Us Research Program is calling on one million people to join us as we try to change the future of health for your family, for future generations, for all of us. Visit joinallofus.org and find out how you can become one in a million. You talk to in every family, small conversations can make a big impact. I grew up on tour with my parents. Kind of different, but we bonded over music just like other families do over sports, camping, or other interests. And we talked. Little everyday conversations from silly to serious that built a foundation over time. Honest conversations, like when my dad shared his experiences as an alcoholic. Your honesty about that part of your life gave me a sense of integrity that I wanted to uphold in my own life. And I was so grateful that you and mom had become these sober, stable people who were always there for me. I wanted you to know from someone who's been in recovery more than 30 years now, that hard work is what creates success, not alcohol or other drugs, whether it's music or anything else. I said it a lot, and I'm glad you took it to heart. Talk, they hear you. For more information about talking with your kids about underage use of alcohol and other drugs, visit underagedrinking.samhsa.gov. Our son Arjun was six weeks old and already had his first intestinal surgery when he was diagnosed with cystic fibrosis. CF is a rare genetic life-shortening disease that affects every organ in the body and makes breathing difficult. At age three and a half, Arjun looks completely normal, but on his belly are scars from being in the operating room nine times, which can be a reminder of our family's daily fight to extend his life. Please help us win this fight. Join families like ours for Great Strides, the Cystic Fibrosis Foundation's national walk in support of Arjun and all those living with CF. Every year, thousands of people lace up to raise money and awareness for CF. The CF Foundation has made amazing progress, but until CF stands for Cure Found, for all people with CF, including those like my son Arjun, we will not stop. The biggest reason I stride? Because I want Arjun to live a full and happy life. Visit cff.org and sign up for our Great Strides Walk today. Lace up, walk, cure cystic fibrosis. Most of us like to be out in the sun. That's why sunscreen and other safety measures are key to protecting your skin from aging and cancer. The FDA recommends using a sunscreen with an SPF of 15 or higher. Also, look for broad spectrum on the label. That means both harmful ultraviolet A and B rays are blocked. Remember, SPF plus broad spectrum equal healthy fun in the sun. Visit www.fda.gov slash sunscreen for more information. A message from the U.S. Food and Drug Administration. But one of the greatest things, one of the greatest character traits, one of the most powerful tools, something called poise. Write down the word poise. P-O-I-S-E. Poise. I got to have poise under pressure. I can't allow the rattle to cause me to say things that I will regret later. I don't need to say things that cause permanent damage with temporary emotion. Welcome back to Ambo TV. Uh, I don't know about my viewers at home, but I know this week what I'm going to be taking away is Pastor Jordan Poole and throwing shade. And the way, you know, we really have to be mindful about watching our tongue and watching what we say to other people. Uh, Pastor Ashley, how do you feel about, you know, everything that we have to listen to and, and everything Pastor Paul was saying about throwing shade? Well, I really love what you're saying because it is so hard to tame the tongue. And Absolutely. so I agree with you. This week I'm going to work on not throwing shade on social media, not throwing shade in real life, watching my words. <laughs> okay, yeah, I totally agree because, you know, social media is a thing. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially for people in the public, we have to be, you know, for pastors and, mm -hmm. and also alike, we have to be super mindful yeah. about the things that we say. From this point forward, I think I'm gonna just go ahead and try to be as kind as possible Good and work. just stay away from anybody that has anything yeah. negative to say. Kindness is always the best approach. Absolutely. <laughs> and on that note, we're gonna go ahead and thank our partnering churches, uh, Fresh Life, Hope Church, and Northridge. And I would also like to thank 
our esteemed guest, Pastor <laughs> Ashley at Liberty Church here in New York. Uh, thank you for joining us today. Really, it's been a pleasure, and I really hope you come back. I would love to. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks, you guys, for watching. This has been Ambo TV, and don't forget to check out ambotv.com for some more great content and great sermons. I'll see you guys later.